There is a debate raging around whether app models will be the winners of the AI boom or whether ultimately the foundation model companies will just eat everything. New funding for Cursor puts an interesting spin on the conversation. Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. One of the big news items to end out this week was that AI coding startup Cursor just raised a fresh $2.3 billion at a $29.3 billion valuation. Now, that sort of rarefied air is a valuation that so far has been exclusively for the model companies. And so what's interesting to me about it is not just to explore the fundraising in isolation, but as a representative example of how people are thinking about the battle between the application layer and the model layer. You might have seen this tweet floating around this week. It comes from investor and entrepreneur Yushan and got 20 million views this week for what is ultimately sort of an insider baseball type of conversation. This is the foundation of our entire conversation, so let's read what he has to say and then break it down a little bit. Ishan writes, My AI investment thesis is that every AI application startup is likely to be crushed by rapid expansion of the foundational model providers. App functionality will be added to the foundational model's offerings because the big players aren't slow incumbents. It is wrong to apply the analogy of fast startup slow incumbent here. They're just big. Far more so than with any other prior new technology, there is a massive and fast-moving wave that obsoletes every new app almost as fast as it can be invented. There is almost no time to build a company and scale it. Wong continues, There are two ways AI application startup founders can make money. One, make a flash-in-the-pan app that generates a ton of cash and bank the cash. My estimate is that you have about 12 to 18 months of cash flow generation. Or two, make a good enough app that you get acquired by one of the big players for sufficient equity. The situation is highly unstable. We don't know if it's going to crash or go to the moon, but both scenarios make it very unlikely that any AI application startup will independently become a generational super company. The best odds are finding an application niche in a highly specialized field with extremely unique and specific data barriers, ideally ones related to real atoms, hardware or world-related data, and not software and finance. So the key elements of the argument here are one, that foundation model providers will eat the app layer, basically that we have to throw out our old heuristics around slow incumbents versus fast startups because the incumbents here are driving disruption at extreme speed. The second point, however, which he gets into in a follow-up post on his own thread, is that the foundation is too unstable to build lasting app businesses. So Yishan continues in a subsequent post, The entire novelty of this thesis is that unlike in the past, specific elements of the AI industry are likely to make it so that application companies cannot outrun the wave of obsolescence, which will rush along far, far more quickly than prior technology waves. The foundational technology has not stabilized in any way whatsoever, and applications require a sufficiently stable foundation for some extended period of time in order to create value and then a system for monetizing that value. The wholesale rate of change in the nature of the foundation is the reason why I think almost all application startups will not survive to achieve any significant scale, not because the current large players are special. So this is the nuance that it would be easy to lose in this conversation. What he's really talking about is a speed of change argument. And he's effectively arguing that app startups will get overtaken by sea changes before they can become real businesses, and that it's not that the big labs are quote-unquote better in any specific way, but that only they have enough internal stability and resources to survive the chaos that they themselves are creating. He concludes in his second post, Seed changes are now happening on a 9-12 to month cycle. Very few startups can turn into a mature business in that time frame. And by mature, I mean having all the boring stuff like sales relationships and brand recognition. Yes, your engineers can make the change, but human hiring cycles and team solidification and market relations are incompressible. E.g., if you hire 100 people a month, your organization will implode. Thus, application companies never quite make it to a full business threshold before the sea change happens out from under them. When I say the incumbents will take the application space, I mean that they're the only ones who can provide enough internal stability and resources to survive the sea changes they themselves will be driving. Not that they're going to provide a superior product. They're just the ones who won't starve. So like I said, this had 20 million views and generated a huge amount of conversation both on the post and even in other channels like LinkedIn. So let's talk first about the people who thought that Yashan was wrong in some fundamental way. Many of these themes can be sort of bundled into the idea that vertical apps, workflows, or UX still matter hugely. David Roberts writes, I think you're underestimating how much unique UX, context engineering, integrations, human in the loop, and embedded workflows need to exist for any vertical business application to actually get from 70% decent to 100% outcomes with AI. Vertical applications are going to be enormous and they will not be eaten by the foundational model providers. Now, implicit in David's argument is that the stuff that it takes to make a vertical application specifically for business, a B2B application work, is so immense and complex 
that it's just not in the incentive of the foundation model companies to do that. And certainly this is a point that I resonate with, seeing how much last mile integration work it takes for a very powerful AI tool to be actually useful inside the context of a business. Now, Yashan actually responded to this one saying, your reasoning here supports my thesis rather than undermining it. What I think he means is that there's going to be so much change so fast that the app layer companies aren't going to be able to survive long enough to do that sort of complex last mile work that David is talking about, ultimately leaving it only to the foundation model companies, even if they don't prioritize it in the short term. Aaron Levy from Box, who's one of the most thoughtful thinkers when it comes to enterprise AI, says, the counter dynamic to the AI model doing everything is that, at least in the enterprise, bridging the AI model's capabilities to the customer's environment still requires a tremendous amount of long tail work. The gap between an AI agent working for 90 or 95% of the solution and 100% is usually about 10x more work than most realize. So here you see Aaron reinforcing many of the themes from David's post. He continues getting access to the enterprise data, connecting to the enterprise workflows, delivering the change management that employees need to adopt the technology, handling the regulatory and compliance requirements of that industry, and so on, all require some degree of highly dedicated focus in a domain. Others argue that Yashan might be underestimating the new types of moats that could be formed. Investor Natasha Malpani writes, I'd say the opposite. The real white space is at the application layer. Everyone wants to sell shovels, but the gold is in how people actually use them. The infra race is a knife fight between hyperscalers, OpenAI, Google, Anthropic, Meta, Amazon. They'll undercut each other on price, latency, context window, and token cost until margins collapse. Developer tooling looks safer, but it's crowding fast, and every improvement gets absorbed upstream by the foundation models or downstream by open source forks. Meanwhile, applications are where behavioral moats form. Data isn't the only barrier. Habits are. Users don't live in APIs or eval dashboards, they live in experiences. Context, workflow, brand, and trust compound fast. Distribution and feedback loops create data advantages that scale locally even when models converge globally. You win if you own feedback surface to capture every edit, action, and intent. Build domain depth and embed in daily workflows, collect proprietary exhaust. Behavior and telemetry that the model providers will never see. Some infra will break through, security, evals, low latency edge, compliance, but the broader white space is still at the application layer, where people, agents, and systems actually interact. Go deep enough that a foundation model can't care, and sticky enough that users won't leave even when it can. Now again, I really want to double click on this foundation model can't care piece. A huge amount of the work that is required right now for AI applications to work inside enterprises is work that foundation models do not have the luxury of caring about. It is simply too much complex, boring, repetitive, but still customized to the customer work, which is why that outside of the foundation model companies, the firms that have done the best from the AI boom are the big systems integrators and consulting firms. The fact that the foundation model companies have to compete on other vectors creates a window of opportunity for a different category of company to swoop in and do the work that it takes to actually bring these solutions to market and practice. Now, the other point from Natasha that I want to really double click on is this idea of proprietary exhaust. For those of you who don't live in Silicon Valley jargon, that paragraph might have seemed really dense. Let's read it again. You win if you own feedback surface to capture every edit, action, and intent build domain depth, embed in daily workflows, collect proprietary exhaust, i.e. behavior and telemetry that the model providers will never see. Exhaust is the data that comes out of the usage of a product. And many of the folks that are most excited about the application layer when it comes to AI have a thesis that when it comes to improving model performance, this type of behavioral exhaust is the real gold because it's the only thing that's not commoditized to everyone else. In other words, the foundation model companies all have access to the exact same trading data, more or less, or some version of the same trading data. But a company that gets enough usage can create a feedback loop where they actually see how people are interacting with the models, and that data stream can be used to refine how the model and also the experience that the model lives in works. This is going to be particularly relevant to our example of Cursor, which we'll come to in a moment. Still, even with all of these arguments for why Yishan's thesis might be wrong or at least limited, There's a big overlap in the Venn diagrams between these two camps that I think would acknowledge that many AI apps are just flimsy wrappers and that the real winners are likely to be the deep autonomous systems. Jacques Reynolds writes, Most new AI apps aren't defensible. They're just UI wrappers on top of someone else's model. The mode disappears the moment OpenAI or Anthropic ships the same feature natively. The real upside isn't in building another AI app, in my opinion. I think it's in implementing AI inside existing business workflows, where data, context, and customer relationships create real barriers. Chong Call builds this thesis out even farther. He writes, 
The issue isn't that foundational models will kill application startups. It's that most AI applications today aren't really applications. They're shallow automations built to impress investors on a six-month time frame. He basically makes a comparison to early SaaS and says today the same story is repeating with AI agents. Duct tape workflows, zero defensibility, no reliability at scale. But the core question hasn't changed. Who's building a system that delivers real value repeatably, reliably, and autonomously? So the implication of this is that if you are building an application, you have to build it deep, you have to be hands-on, you have to be in a position to actually capture that behavioral exhaust data. Now Fall writes, I think even if a new application starts on this constantly evolving base, it can endure if it embeds itself in existing workflows, writes to proprietary systems of record, builds proprietary data, and learns from usage and or captures distribution before incumbents bundle the feature. More importantly, AI wrappers that continue to swiftly ship features that solve users' needs, even as competition arrives, are difficult to compete with even for the foundation models. And so again, I think that you're starting to see the through line here that acknowledges the incredible speed at which things are changing and the new challenges that it creates for the app layer, as well as the innovation capability of the big foundation model companies, but still sees this core path for some number of extremely high performant application layer companies. And indeed, a lot of the responses was about what it takes to be one of these actually successful application layer companies. Sarah Catanzaro writes, my AI investment thesis is that AI application startups will need to solve research and engineering problems that the labs are not currently focused on, thereby accumulating more technical defensibility. At times, their objectives may even diverge. We already see this in creative industries, where post-training alignment impedes the ability of models to produce diverse outputs. It will be hard to survive since the app companies will also need to define compelling workflows and user experiences, but with the right team and support, some, but not all, will make it. A16Z's Anisha Shara writes about a few approaches that he thinks advantage app layer startups. The first are categories that benefit from being multimodal, basically where the experience for the end customer is better if they can access models from different providers, cornered resources, those locked proprietary data sets, and ecosystems that, quote, imply a ton of feature surface area. He gives the example of Granola. Sure, you can replicate Granola's recorder, but is OpenAI really going to build the entire ecosystem of productivity apps implied by it? Now, regardless of what we all think about this, the reality is that money is still pouring in. The Information, for example, recently published a piece called Investors Chase Neo Labs to Outflank OpenAI and Anthropic. They point out that over the last month, those investors have made or discussed $2.5 billion of investments into just five startups. The Information writes, The Neo Labs startup's founders say they hope to exploit new approaches to developing AI models and research they say major developers like OpenAI and Anthropic may have overlooked. And that brings us to the Cursor part of the story. Now, Cursor is, of course, one of the big breakout leaders of the last year. When the story of 2025 is written, AI coding will be at the very top of the narratives, and one need look no further than the valuation jumps of Cursor to see just how big a deal at least investors are treating that whole theme as. The company has raised $2.3 billion in a new round that values them at $29.3 billion. That is close to triple their $9.9 .9 billion valuation from their Series C in June, and a 12x compared to their valuation from the beginning of the year. In addition to the funding, Cursor also announced that they've reached a billion dollars in ARR and that they now produce more code than any other coding agent. Yu Chen Jin did the research and commented, Cursor is almost certainly the fastest company in history to reach a billion dollars in ARR, achieving this milestone in a little over two years. He added, and let's see if you can spot the connection to our broader theme today, people said Cursor would go to zero because it's just a wrapper. AI products won't be monopolized by model labs, in my opinion. One, products win by delivering real user value. Model capability alone isn't enough. Two, once they hit product market fit, companies can train their own models, often based on open source models combined with their own unique data and RL environments. Cursor's Composer 1 is an example. Now, Composer, which is Cursor's proprietary model, seems central to their business strategy moving forward. They said that they intend to use this fresh capital to invest further in developing Composer. The Wall Street Journal framed this raise, in fact, as being a test case to see if app layer startups can transition away from relying on the foundation model companies. They noted that both OpenAI and Anthropic are now directly competing with Cursor. When asked about this, Cursor CEO and co-founder Michael Truel gave a diplomatic response, stating, We're excited to be one of the first examples of a large company built on their platforms. All of the AI labs are important partners to us. But clearly Composer, their unique model, is top of mind. Truel said, it does take significant resources, both specialized talent and also GPUs, to do something at Composer's scale. This funding lets us do it in a big way. 
cursor also showed just how much the model environment is changing. Back in April, the most popular models on Cursor were Claude 3.7 Sonnet, Gemini 2.5 Pro, Claude 3.5 Sonnet, and then in 4th and 5th place, GPT-4.1 and GPT-4.0. The fastest growing in April were O3, O4 Mini, and DeepSeq version 3.1. Today, the most popular models are in the 1st place, Sonnet 4.5, in the 2nd place, Composer 1, and then after that, GPT-5, GPT-5 Codex, and Sonnet 4. The fastest growing, however, is Composer 1. All of which brings us to an interesting point about where this Venn diagram between the app layer and the model layer overlaps, which is at some point, do the handful of app layer companies that can break through and reach the scale to survive just become model companies themselves? That certainly seems to be part of the direction here with Cursor, and I think will be an interesting thing to watch. Anyways, it's a fascinating discussion, and I think if you take away anything, it just shows that right now things are changing so fast that even the people whose entire job it is to watch and understand and allocate against these movements, don't really have any idea what's happening. We are all just students with the very fast-spinning world, our teacher. For now, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening or watching as always. Until next time, peace.